and welcome to episode 5 of the Ubuntu UK podcast with Simon, Davey, Alan and I'm Tony. On the show this week we're going to interview Pete Savage. We're going to talk to Laura about CLI versus GUI. We have hardy install experiences. We've got more sarcastic news and have a chat with Phil Newbra. And we're going to give you the results of the competition. And read out your emails. Sounds like a fun packed show. Let's, Let's get on, on with it. it. We have Pete Savage, who uh, has a presence on pretty much every Ubuntu machine on the planet. Pete, how did that happen? That happened uh, because I took it upon myself to design the uh, startup sound for Ubuntu. The funky drums and stuff. The funky drums and stuff. Does it, the, does it have a name? The edgy dance, as it was coined at one of the uh, conferences, I think. The edgy dance? Yeah. And is there a dance to go with it? I, I've never seen the dance. Um, I wasn't at a conference, but... Uh, That's probably for the best, to be honest. <laughs> I, I think so. I'm sure Tony, at this point, can insert the sound. You did a startup and a shutdown, and what else? I, I actually only did a startup and a shutdown. And the shutdown what nobody hears what? anymore, do they? No, nobody hears anymore because the uh, the teardowns too quick. It shuts down too quickly. For how long was was the shutdown music? Oh, it was only about two or three seconds. But the machine shut down so quick, you can't hear it. So, how did you make the sounds? How did you make the music? Well, it was all done using open source uh, tools, using um, the Ardour package, which oh, yeah. is a fantastic multi tracker. A lot of people say it's very difficult to learn how to use, and I did agree that if you haven't used multi-trackers before it's a bit daunting but after you get uh, after you use it for a bit it's, it's fine it's a really nice package to use and produce some really great results i decided i was going to create these uh, these sounds and i had a korg x5d keyboard uh, which is where a lot of the sounds came from and just played around with it i did about 10 sounds or so and posted them up on the wiki and said to people you know have a look give me some comments on on what you like and don't like and then I coordinated with the uh, one of the art directors at the time, which was uh, Frank Schwab, and we took them to Mark and said, "Do you want to have a listen and tell us which ones you like?" And he picked the one out, which um, which I must admit was the one that I I preferred. The one that we currently have. The one that we currently have, yeah. But we cut it down considerably. It was about twelve seconds um, to begin with, and that was the length of time it took for my desktop to start up. <laughs> Everybody else it seems to be a lot shorter, so they said, no, it goes on way too long, way too long. Yeah, people so, are already browsing the web by the time you're starting. Exactly. <laughs> what sort of feedback did you have? Uh, we had some, we had very, very good feedback, actually. There was a lot of comments on the on the Ubuntu wiki, and I think they're all still there, and all the links to all the original um, sounds that I created are still there. In fact, the sound changed quite considerably. Originally, it had a very, we started off with a very low bit sound, so we took it down to about 8 bits and really bit crunched it so it sounded very tinny and very um, distorted and then as it moved through it faded from that to a very high quality version yeah I remember that yeah, it was kind of like a transition to show how the you know you were moving into a different world as you were loading up Ubuntu. But um, unfortunately, that wasn't so well received, so we we cut that out and we just went with the standard sound. Um, and one of the sounds I still use um, I use on my phone as an SMS um, <laughs> message received tone. It works quite well. <laughs> and it's still in Ubuntu now. It's in. It is. I'm really surprised actually. Somebody filed a bug against it in Launchpad as well. Oh, really? There was, oh, a, yeah. there was a Launchpad bug saying, "Please revert the edgy sounds." Oh God. Back to the that. ones that were in Dapper. Do you know, I can't even yeah. remember the sound that was in Dapper. Nope. It's I can't that long ago. You've also been involved in uh, the Edubuntu project. What's Edubuntu all about? Edubuntu used to be a um, almost a separate distro with Ubuntu as its base. Now it's moved more to be um, an add-on CD, and that's the way it's going to be moving towards, I think. And what, what do you get in Edubuntu that you don't get in standard Ubuntu or Kubuntu or Zubuntu? Edubuntu was primarily geared towards the educational sector and had different packages pre-installed uh, with educational tools and different artwork and things like that. Designed for kids or...? Yeah, design, well, originally designed more for kids, but um, when I was involved, it was we were trying to gear it more towards education in general and providing um, different themes and tools so that it would be happily placed at, you know, at university level and college level as well. And do you know if it's being used heavily or, or is it...? it was getting, we were getting quite a few um, people come back and say, you know, yeah, I'm using this in the classroom. It was getting very heavily used, I think, more in the um, more in uh, third world countries and, and places like that. It uses LTSP, doesn't it? The, the yeah, it's thin a thin client, client system. Very easy to set up. In fact, the 
edge Ubuntu install disk that we used to use. Um, I can't can't say about the current one because I haven't used it, but the the one that we used to use in in Edge and Feisty had the LTSP system all all installed when you installed the server, and you could then just quite happily boot up clients. They'd pick up an IP address from that server, um, and the IP address the HTTP server would also send out information about the um, TFTP file. Um, and where it should download it, and it would then download a very, very thin down Linux OS, uh, which basically just consisted of an X server, and it would then boot back off of the main server, and you'd be using a graphical terminal which was actually present on the server instead of um, running anything off the client. So, oh, so you could use like really thin, you know, almost dumb terminal like exactly. desktops. Oh, cool. And of course, it's very good from a um, administration point of view if you want to install an application on everybody's machine. You just install it on the server and it magically appears on everybody's machine. No reboots, no nothing. And are there admin tools built into it that uh, are suitable for administering internet access and things for school children? Yeah, I believe they were being developed. At the time, we were working on um, on developing those, and I actually worked on Thin Client Manager, uh, which was kind of a administration system. Just when I, I stopped working on it, we were just getting to the stage where you could watch people's screens and then blank their screen out. You could log them off. You could send them a message. You could... It was it was coming along quite nicely. So, so did you actually use VNC for that, or was that uh, something else you used to actually monitor? That was VNC, using? yeah. We were looking at writing a kind of um, a driver that would work on the client itself and build it into the X server, but no, we were actually using VNC to begin with. And as such, it was a little slow and it required some optimizing, but we got there in the end. And was there actually um, content filtering included in the distro, like Dan's Guardian or something similar? It was being worked on, but um, at the time when I was working on it, it was I don't think it was actually put in place and finished. Um, not in an easy form of use anyway, um, but it was being worked on. Do you know what sort of deployments and things it's got, whether it's got any large take-up? I don't know. We we got quite a few um, we got quite a few people coming back and saying, oh, I'm using this in a fairly large establishment. And uh, indeed, one of the things that I was trying to do when I was there was to um, consolidate this information and put it up somewhere so people could go along and see you know, who was using this. But uh, it was one of the many things that we uh, that we tried to do, and uh, I never really got around to doing. So you you don't um, work on Edge Ubuntu anymore at the moment? Not at the moment, no. My my time has been taken up with uh, with many other things. And one of those other things is uh, a uh, video podcast that you've put together called Progbox. Indeed, Progbox. Yeah. What made you decide to create a video podcast? I first of all decided I wanted to do um, an audio podcast, and then I decided that nobody really want to listen to my voice for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we think the same thing. You'd be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided I'd make it a bit more interesting and turn it into a video podcast. And it was it basically started as a can I actually do this using, you know, free software? Is this actually gonna be possible? Can I do all the video editing? And with the equipment that I had, because I don't have a proper video um, camera at all, um, I'm using an, an Olympus C eighty eighty still camera, just switching it to video mode. It was basically a challenge to myself. Can I do this? Can I make it interesting? And are people actually gonna watch it? Um, what tools do you use? I'm currently using KDE and Live, oh. which is a nice video editor. Um, when I first started using it, it, it crashed a lot, but then Kino crashed about the same amount. So uh, <laughs> this was, you know, a couple of years back. So I, I never really looked at it much again. Really easy to use. Um, doing video transitions like fades, um, picture in picture, things like that. Pete, have you um, thought about uh, accessibility of, of your video cast, subtitles and things like that? Is something that you maybe want to aim towards? I have indeed, and I was actually asked by somebody, you know, are you going to put subtitle support in because um, because I'm deaf and I'd really like to, you know, watch the podcast. And I talked to, the main way I distribute the video at the moment is through uh, Miro, and I asked the guys at Miro, do you have subtitle support, and they said no. So I think it's something they're working on, but currently we don't have um, subtitle support on there. Who's your um, target audience? Um, target audience is, is anyone really who's interested in open source, computers in general, technology, and just trying to you know raise awareness of some cool things that I've found so that other people can, can have a go with them and maybe take them on and expand them further. How often do you plan to put an episode out? Uh, at the moment, it's a kind of when I can. 
it's supposed to be monthly, but if I can do it more than monthly, then that's also um, that's also good for me. I'm in discussion with some other people who've got some interest in producing a video uh, a video cast, and so we're wondering whether we can kind of amalgamate them all together under the Progbox name, but kind of rotate it so each person would do one, and then we could possibly release you know once a week even. Yeah. Uh, and with the option of if you get on better with somebody's podcast, you could just have their feed. Whereas if you want to get all of them, you could use the generic feed and get everybody. Right. I just wanted to ask, is it true that you chose to do a video podcast rather than audio one so that people can admire your hair? No. <laughs> Surprisingly, um, I have had comments about my hair, um, most notably from, from you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> who always seems to find new and interesting ways to comment on my hair on whichever website a picture of me happens to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you always have new and interesting hair. Well, well, <laughs> it's true. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show, Pete. And uh, give us the uh, URL to your uh, website. So if anyone wants to watch the video, they know where yeah. to go. Okay, the URL is progbox.co.uk, and you can find all the information there. Great stuff. Thanks, Pete. Cheers, Brilliant. Pete. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Cheers. In episode three, we talked about the command line and GUIs, and actually, while we were there doing our piece, someone was sat in the corner of the room itching to speak but didn't have a microphone. Now you do, Laura. <laughs> what was it you were getting so angry about? <laughs> Basically, I agree with the idea that if you have to drop to the command line in Ubuntu, it's a bug. As long as you qualify that as doing tasks that a normal person would do. Reconfiguring an Apache server, I don't consider a normal task. So I think that's fair enough that you'd have to drop to the command line. But if you expect somebody frequently to have to use the command line to... Connect to the internet. Connect to the internet or mount a USB drive or get music onto their iPod or whatever... I think that is a bug because your average person doesn't care about Linux under the covers. They just want to use a computer as a tool. So is that more uh, in the desktop environment? Yes. You shouldn't have to use a command line, but in a server or advanced administration environment, you should or would expect yeah. to? Yeah, I mean, normal everyday things like email, uh, getting photos off a digital camera, editing your photos, um, even making little movies and things. It doesn't have to be like a video cast or anything it could just be a home movie that sort of thing your average person could do on windows or a mac or whatever and they should be able to do that on ubuntu as well That's so the point so having having to drop to the command line to use a command like ffmpeg to doing re-encoding of stuff is you know is a bug really it should be wrapped yeah. around in a gui or something like that one of the things you were talking about was that a gui is for new users and a command line is for experienced users which i don't think is quite right either because command line is fine for if you want to do certain things and you want to do them fast or you want to do them repetitively or whatever Mm -hmm. i use ubuntu on the desktop and i've used linux on the desktop for quite a few years now and i get really irritated if i have to use a command line to do some basic thing like mount a usb key right and because for whatever reason it's not worked what is it that makes you makes you across or angry or annoyed at having to drop to the command line is it just the annoyance that oh i have to learn something that i don't yeah have i shouldn't have to it should be a button or i think it's if i've not done it frequently i just don't remember it so it means I've got to go and lock it up, which so, is time out from what I'm trying to do. Right, you're wasting wasting time or wasting brain capacity on stuff like obscure command line parameters. I just want to get the photos off the camera. One thing was that, like I so said, when you were talking new users and experienced and things, there's this kind of attitude, not just here in general, that a GUI is um, kind of just a front end bolted onto a command line functionality or a script or whatever which if it's a well-designed GUI it isn't that and um, when I was at FOSDEM in February I went to a Debian accessibility session and the presenter there did a really good presentation about the issues about making a GUI screen reader accessible and why you should do it and the benefits and things like that and um, one of the people in the audience asked a question saying that why do we need to bother? Can't a blind person use the command line? Because the command line will work well with a screen reader because it's all text. There's no pictures and there's no um, two-dimensional layout to deal with or anything Nothing like that. Nothing that's going to get confused by. Exactly. Right. Yeah, if all the GUI is is a visual representation of the command line, then you could possibly say that. But a well-designed GUI completely changes the experience. It fits what the user is trying to do and how they think and how they expect to interact with the machine. 
If you want to reheat last night's takeaway, because and you're tired, you're hungover, and you're hungry, and you don't really want to have to think up the correct sequence of commands to enter, to do that, you just want to do it because you want to get to your food. Think like that when you're thinking about putting a digital camera into a laptop, uh, plugging it in, getting photos off. You don't care how it interacts with the system. You don't want to go to lots of trouble to make it work. It should just work, which on Ubuntu, on the whole, it does now. So I should always, whenever I picture myself doing something on Ubuntu, I should think of myself being tired, hungry, and hungover. <laughs> whenever I do it and that will make me think of the goo. It's not just thinking of the goo, it's just making it easy and not expecting people to have to go look it up in the documentation. Sure. And I'm a technical writer so I appreciate documentation but I don't appreciate having to go look things up and Google it which is one of the comments last in the episode that you were yeah. talking about. Yeah, sorry. Well thanks for that feedback. I appreciate it and sorry you had to sit there in pain when we actually <laughs> recorded the episode first time without a microphone. Are you going to stick around for the rest of the show? Yeah. Cool. So have we upgraded to Hardy yet? Yep. Right, right, so how did you upgrade then? How did you upgrade to Hardy? Well, I tried to upgrade using the Update Manager, and I clicked the little button where it said there is a new release available. Click here to upgrade. When was this? Bef- uh, after, after the release date, yeah? Yes. Right. Yeah, a day or two after the release date. And the first thing it did was blat all the sources of my local mirrors. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, th- yeah, this, is, this is a funny thing, because Tony has... You've got your own local mirror, your own copy. Yeah, I run, I run Apt Mirror, which creates a whole copy of any particular archive. So I have told it to, to mirror all the hardy uh, packages so when i want to install something it installs over my lan rather than over the internet and things like openoffice.org updates don't take two years to download and install it's already there it's really useful if you've got multiple machines I guess, exactly which running which the I same have version got. yeah exactly right. so you've got your local mirror yeah and you hit the button yeah. in update manager to say i want to upgrade to the new release yes and it just went horribly wrong? Or it, it just didn't use your local it mirror? It just didn't use my local mirror. So all it's got to do is replace Gutsy in the sources list with Hardy, rather than blatting all of the lines that are in your, your sources list and overwriting them. But if you've got your own local repo, you're probably a competent enough sys- sysadmin to know what to do in terms of editing sources.list. Yeah. But it would be lovely just to be able to click on the icon and do it in the GUI the same way as everybody else does, because I end up doing it on the command line using aptitude, aptitude dist upgrade. I mean, obviously the question is, have you filed a bug against... Up- Update manager. No. <laughs> well, there you go. But you will Shut have. Shut up, then. <laughs> well, by the time our audience listens to this. Uh, yeah, I, I may have done. There may well already be one. I, to be honest, I haven't looked. Uh, it was uh, and a bit of an annoyance last time around, and it was still annoying this time around. But I do it once every six months, and it doesn't I haven't really f- annoy me enough to uh, to get me off my backside to uh, okay, file, so, file a bug. So that aside, you've upgraded and everything's yeah. fine? Yes, actually. It, I was really pleased um, and quite impressed. There were more things fixed in, in Hardy than broke, which is good for me, on my Samsung Q45 laptop, which is the only machine I've upgraded so far. There were uh, a couple of broken packages when I was actually doing the upgrade that meant I had to run uh, Dist Upgrade a couple of times. I somehow ended up with the Zubuntu uh, GDM, the login screen uh, which i'm not quite sure how i ended up with that um desktop effects now works on my laptop so i can get all the uh slidey spinny uppy downy goodness and do you use it it's on it's on by default now so yeah oh, okay um the resolution is now okay on my q45 oh it was um wrong resolution previously. it didn't support the widescreen resolution it's an intel graphics card yeah intel oh. graphics card and uh alan during one of our podcast recordings rather bravely said oh I've, i'll fix that for you i have tried alan oh no i shall fix it for you and uh after 20 minutes grumpily uh, admitted that he might have been defeated by this but thankfully it's fixed properly in in hardy and, even better, the VGA out now works, so I can now use my laptop for presentations. How often do you do that? <laughs> well, now I can do it more often. <laughs> um, and it, it's configurable via the, the screen resolution config tool as well, so I didn't need to edit any config files. It so just... overall, uh, on a score out of five, how would you say the upgrade experience and post-upgrade has gone? I'm going to go like four and a half out of five. Out of five. Yeah, suspend, oh, suspend and hibernate now seem to work as well. So what, what what was your experience? When did you upgrade? I upgraded on this laptop uh, quite early on in the release cycle. That's a ThinkPad X series, by the way. Yes, uh, the X61 swirly top. Tablet. I think, Tablet, I think yes, we'll find the word yes. <laughs> I upgraded using the, um, well, I actually changed the source pack, the source list. Work all right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this one is quite an old one, and I've put like to do a fresh install to test it better. I've only tried to spend recently, and that didn't work. This is quite a messy install where it's gone through a few distributions. I think it's time for me to actually do a reinstall of this 
I actually have upgraded a few servers this week doing the do release upgrade, and that is actually a fantastic yeah, tool to I use agree. over. I've used that as well. Yeah. Really, really good. So so I've yeah. got some um, family computers which I've um, upgraded, and in fact, one I started the um, started the upgrade and had to leave my computer, and for whatever reason, the um, the SSH link died. And I didn't know how to get it back. Um, I was concerned if I just sort of rebooted it, logged back in, rebooted it, then it would be, you know, involve a massive trip to go and install it manually. But rebooted it, and um, the do release upgrade just picked up where it left off. What's the difference between the do release upgrade then and aptitude dist upgrade? Well, it's actually a wrapper. It's actually a Python wrapper uh, that actually does apt stuff in the background. But one thing I find particularly useful is actually doing it over SSH. It detects you're actually doing it over SSH and actually opens up a, a separate SSH daemon on the port. Um, 9002 I believe so the idea is being that if the SSH session you're in dies then you actually can still get into the server which is really quite handy but I mean there, there are other checks and things that it does um, it'll disable third party uh, repositories in your sources.list for example it doesn't sound hugely incredibly useful to be honest why because I don't see what I get out of it over just running dist upgrade well, in a stream I've not read the code so I don't know exactly no. what it does well the, the thing is you just fire off one command and just forget about it right? do you not want to check what's going on well that's why I'm looking at the source code right, as we speak so where's the time saving oh yes it's a really great script no. well, I just have to poke the through the source is, code I'm to work out what it's doing oh that helps me administer my system. I'm looking because I, I'm choosing to look now if we're looking at everyday users who you do use servers then they don't they don't have to do that they just have to fire off one command do release upgrade easy to remember and it upgrades. I'd be willing to bet you haven't looked at the source code for apt either, Tony. No, I haven't, but I sit and watch what it's saying on the screen when sure. I'm doing an update. And I tend so to I can spot I, the errors. I tend to go and have a cup of tea. I can't imagine to. that the Ubuntu developers would come up with this wrapper for no reason. Yeah. There must be something I'm sure. in it. I'm sure. I just I can't see what that is. Out of five, what do you reckon? I can't I, I've got no real complaints. It works, so I'd probably say I'll, I'll go with Tony and go four and a half. Simon, how about you? Yeah. Have you upgraded any machines? Yeah, I've uh, a number. I've um, been following on my um, my Dell laptop from beta. That's upgraded continually through. I've done a fresh install on my daughter's laptop. I've done the remote install using do release upgrade and um, I've done a fresh install on a new HP G6000, which was fine. Actually, the install was fine, but I've got graphic issues. You've got I've, NVIDIA. Yeah, yeah okay. which I've tried to fix, but um, that's not really, I don't think, a, a Harley Ubuntu issue at all, actually. So I probably go for user, a, user failure. Yeah, what? yeah I, I, uh, anyway, it's not working. We'll have a play but, with uh, that. We'll have a play with that. Alan can promise to fix yours as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll match your 4.5. To be honest, I'd probably go for a 5. I've had absolutely no problems at all with it. There, there was one server upgraded this week. Now, I did a release from da uh, upgrade from Dapper to Hardy and I was actually quite concerned about this that there must how old is Dapper now that's 606 that's well <laughs> 2006 second half yeah, well middle basically two years yeah so I mean to, to, to do an upgrade from that I mean yeah that's been tested well the server it was in use and I was worried that some of the some of the tweaks I've possibly done wouldn't work through it through upgrade and it worked fine so but then two years isn't really all that long. It's it's seen quite a few Ubuntu revisions. But as Mark Shuttleworth said in the last last show, you know Debian will go from releases that are three or four or five years apart and effectively be a supported upgrade between those releases. So it is those kind of underpinnings that mean it should just work. Upgrading you know, yeah, two year but, upgrades. Yeah. I mean the actual upgrades work and the, and the packages will work. But I'm talking about when these machines get heavily used and you install non-packaged software on there. I always get concerned when I'm upgrading them because they might get left behind. You know, yeah, they don't they don't get thing. tested as thoroughly yeah I mean I mean, things like Zimbra and things like that I mean that, that was one when I had to upgrade this week and you know I was quite concerned about that that would just break with huge downtime and when it just works it, it really is a good feeling Laura you've you've got a laptop there is that one that you've upgraded or yes it's my Samsung Q35 and that upgraded okay I wasn't that keen on Gutsy as a as a distribution I'd, for, so I don't I can't remember exactly what but I had all kinds of problems and the sound now works that's a bonus um, your, 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 your card reader didn't work under Gutsy, did it? Yeah, my card reader only works now because I've bought an SD card instead of an MMC card. Have, have you tried an MMC card in this since the upgrade? Yeah, I think so, yes. And is that working now? No. Nope. Oh. It's a non-issue. <laughs> I think Laura's not going to give it 5 out of 5. <laughs> I'm not giving it 5 out of 5 because the desktop effect still doesn't work. How many, what out of 5? 4. 4. Ooh, Ooh, that's still not bad. Yeah. Which that's is quite bad. harsh around here, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've had a desktop that's been running hardy since alpha, and I've had no problems with that. It's got dual screen NVIDIA binary driver. It's got loads of stuff plugged into it, like USB, you know, keyboard and uh, webcam and all kinds of funky stuff. 
USB sound card. I still have issues with um, the Pulse Audio because there's a game that I like to play that, that doesn't work with it. But I think that's a yeah, that's a Pulse Audio Alsa OSS type issue, not a specifically Hardy issue. Although obviously upgrading to hardware, ha- Hardy has broken that game for me. Um, I've got a laptop, a Toshiba laptop that um, I've upgraded to Hardy. That just works, no problem at all. Everything works. Uh, touch screen. Uh, it's a tablet as well. Card reader network sound everything just works i think the only thing i haven't actually tested is a modem because i never use a modem anymore but yeah everything works i remember you saying during the week you did actually have a problem upgrading insofar as you only had a couple of gigs spare on the dit on the you didn't know that space. was that was on my um asus epc i uh I, I ran out of disk space on that when i tried to upgrade to hardy as i say you only need that space for a short time whilst you actually do the upgrade and then you 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 have that space back again I mean, yeah, you know, that that is potentially a bug. No, no, it's not. It's delete some files. Be more organised and don't be such a hoarder. I mean, what what would be good is if the update thing said you have insufficient disk space to continue. I've never tried it on a system yes, with it. Does it does do it that? Does exactly that. So, uh, you know, I. <sighs> The update manager can't give you more disk space. Yeah, it's not going to magically... No, no. No, what I mean is, uh, is there potential for better um, organisation, so download packages as you're upgrading? Actually, I've seen a couple of people um, mention a couple of things along this line, like, for example, downloading as you go and also asking all the questions up front. I think one of the guys on the Fresh Ubuntu podcast complained that the fact that he left his upgrade running and then in the middle of the night it stopped to ask him a question and the next day he walks up to his machine thinking it would be finished and actually it's asking a question. It's a reasonable request to make to say all the questions should be done up front. But one of the problems is that the questions that it asks are so late in the process that it's difficult for it to tell what Mm. questions it would need to ask until it gets into a situation where there's a resolution that needs sorry a conflict that needs resolving and presumably it's a bit of a catch-22 because on one hand you want to download the packages as you go and the other hand you want to download all the packages to get all the questions out of them because those upgrade questions are part of those packages to ask you all the questions at the beginning so if, if you if you download as you go you can't get all the questions at the beginning if you want all the questions at the beginning you can't download as you go there's a corporate application that i use at work which has two methods for doing upgrades when you're upgrading it one is downtime minimized and one is disk space minimized so it could well be that in the future we have upgrades which have uh, an option you know you can choose to have minimized downtime but takes up lots and lots of disk space because it brings down all the packages and then does a flip to to turn all the new packages on and you know ask you all the questions and you deal with all of that up front and then you just flick a switch and it's and it's upgraded or a disk space minimized one where it downloads the packages as it needs it but it takes a long time and you get a long amount of downtime i, I don't know if that kind of thing would be possible with, mm. with the upgrade tools yeah to actually have the choice between yeah 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 i think that's 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 potentially a good idea yeah you write that alan score what's your score uh, I, i'd actually give it a four and a half wow just, uh, where just because the sound didn't work and yeah okay it's not really a hardy problem and I, it, well the sound does work on both my machines that i've upgraded but it's just that one game that it's four and four and three quarters oh. all right four and three quarters <laughs> Right, who's going to work out the average of all those? It's 4.45. Thanks to my Ubuntu calculator. We give Ubuntu Hardy 4.45 out of 5. The FSF approved distribution GNU Sense, GNU Sense, GNU Sense, or nuisance. possibly GNU uh, have released a new version based on Ubuntu Hardy. New release, same old wireless problems. Adobe are opening up the Flash formats, so this should mean that we'll get new, different implementations of FLV and SWF uh, decoders and stuff. Oh, good. Soon you'll be able to watch grannies falling off logs in total freedom. The UK's Unix user group has convinced the High Court to carry a judicial review of the British Standards Institute's decision to vote in favour of Microsoft's controversial Open Office XML format. Wow, I think I'll have to hunt high and low for evidence for that one. Spam is 30 years old. Happy birthday. Oh yeah, I think I got an e-card about that. Son, are in the process of certifying Ubuntu. While they give with one hand, they take away from MySQL with the other. Okay, we've got Phil Nuber on the phone to talk to us about uh, his involvement in uh, Ubuntu in the UK. Hello, Phil. Hello. You're, you're a member of the, the Ubuntu UK Loco team. Uh, you hang around on IRC, you're on the mailing list, 
Um, one of the things that I've noticed you've uh, you've done a lot of is is advocacy. You've got a blog. Um, what's the what's the website? Yeah, it's uh, Crunchbang. And it's um, syndicated on the Ubuntu UK planet. And they're, they're pretty much all advocacy and the odd rant here and there, I remember. So what made you start getting into Ubuntu then? Well, I've, I've used Ubuntu for a long time, actually. It's um, more a case of I'd set this blog up, so I've just, you know, something to do. And thought I'd, you know, write about my adventures with Ubuntu, really. <laughs> that was it, right? Do you use it on desktops, laptop servers? What's what's your typical usage of it? Yeah, I use it on all my machines. I've got several laptops and one desktop. Do other members of the family get involved in that? No, the uh, Becky, she's uh, that's my partner. She still runs Windows, so, and Emma, that's our daughter. She yeah, she's a Windows vista. So I keep saying to her that you know, I'll put Linux on there for her. And uh, she keeps looking at me with big puppy dog eyes. Oh, can you put Linux on? Can you put Linux on? So uh, Becky won't let me, so... I, I had much the same with uh, with my wife when I first started showing her Linux. She was very reluctant, and then I just did it, and she had no choice. <laughs> yeah. Well, she has said, actually, because uh, we're planning on getting married, and she's looking at me now, giving me evil. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. But, yeah, we're planning on getting married, and she said that can be my wedding present. I can install... I can install Ubuntu on, on their machines. That, that'll be one great wedding night, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <Yeah. laughs> one thing that I've noticed that uh, has been quite successful is the um, the little advertisements that you've done for Ubuntu. They're, they're all over the place. I've got them on my blog, and I know I see them pop up on various other Ubuntu, Ubuntu websites. What, what prompted you to create those? Yeah, they are all over the place. I could, yeah, I keep bumping into them. It's bizarre when you, you sort of like browse the web and you come across them. And I think, ooh, I did that. <laughs> um, I don't know, really. I think I may have spotted a couple of messages on the mailing list. You know, some people saying, is there any adverts or anything that we can use to put on our website? So I thought, you know, I'd create something like that. You've done little images for um, promoting OpenOffice, uh, the GIMP, Firefox, and a few other applications. And uh, have you had much feedback from people about them? Yeah, I mean, the feedback was quite good, actually. I, I did the initial one. Um, I did it in English. When I posted the images, I put up the GIMP files, basically, you know, if anybody wants to translate them or, you know, here's the source files, do what you want with them. Within about an hour, I got a reply from some Spanish guy who translated them. What have we got? Serbian, Russian, Elvish. <laughs> I don't know yeah, I'm not sure oh about that one. We're one step away from actually, Klingon, aren't we, really? <laughs> um, what did we get? Elvish, Turkish, French, Polish, Fantastic. Romanian, Japanese, Dutch, and Italian. So. And these just all got emailed to you and you put them online and you know, people yeah, can read them in their website? Yeah, people emailed me about it and you know, left comments saying I've done a Russian version and whatnot. It turned out to be quite a bit of work, actually. I think, you know, so. Particularly artistic, then? I do a lot of uh, pen and ink drawings and whatnot as well. And um, you actually find the GIMP actually serves all your art purposes, do you? Yeah, it's great piece of kit, really. I've, you know, I've quite happily opened up the GIMP and it can pretty much do anything I need it to. Another thing I wanted to talk about was your uh, your your fork of Ubuntu, which is Crunchbang. Yes, Crunchbang. How did that come about? What is it? It's just a remastered version of Ubuntu, really. What's different about it from Ubuntu? Well, I think the main thing is it runs the open box um, window manager instead of the full GNOME desktop environment. So. And, and what's special about open box? Oh, uh, what isn't special about? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, well. I mean, OpenBox is great. I've, you know, it's lightweight. It's really configurable as well. Just through you know, a few text files, you can edit your menus. Um, you can edit startup programs. It's, so, uh, so, is it really good for for old hardware? A bit like as Ubuntu is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a lot lighter than the GNOME environment. I think it runs pretty well on new systems as well. So, why did you create uh, a whole distribution? It must be a lot of work. Well, I didn't really create the whole distribution, did I? <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> to be it's, fair uh, yes. I mean, basically all it is is Ubuntu, but it's just been, you know, tinkered with and probably mucked around more than it should have been and uh, stuck on a CD and, and that's it, really. Is it fairly straightforward to remaster the CD to put, like... Yeah, I mean, I didn't find it particularly hard. It's um, I used um, the remaster sys script. I mean, if you just go to Google and type in remaster sys, you should sure. find the homepage. And do you think you'll be able to keep it up, making your own version of Ubuntu? It's a lot of hard work, I've got to say. So yeah, because I, I actually sensed from your release notes that it was actually a bit of a tongue-in-cheek um, release when, when, for your first one. But, but now, is it starting to be serious? No. 
<laughs> <laughs> it's just a bit of a laugh a and something fun. to pass the time. Do you think uh, once you get married, there'll be uh, other things calling on your time and uh, you won't be able to spend as much time on this? Uh, when we get married, no, probably I'll probably have more time to spend. <laughs> <laughs> you've um, you've also, I know, um, applied for um, Ubuntu membership. I, mean, I don't know about you, Phil, but I mean, I, I, I certainly do have some sympathy for you, really, because I remember quite how nervous it was waiting for the process, you know, to try and understand what the process was. Am I really ready? Are they going to turn around and say no? I mean, the thing is, when you feel yourself... You're, you're not helping, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I mean... I, I know some people because I mean I have I mean I, I said that you know go for it. Um, it's, it's when you're actually trying to think to yourself, am I ready? But and everyone around you is saying yes, good, do it, do it. You know I'll, I'll back you up there. And you think oh it's really quite scary. So I, I do ask you know. Uh, uh, hang on, are we talking about him getting married or are we talking about Ubuntu membership? <laughs> well, I, I, I think a bit of both to be fair. <laughs> Well, thank you for talking to us today, Phil. It's been really interesting. And uh, good luck with the Ubuntu membership. You have to drop us a line and let you know if you let us know when you've been successful. Yeah, great. Thanks. Will do. Okay, yeah. and we'll speak to you soon. Cheers, Phil. Yeah, cheers. cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. In episode four, we asked you, what's the name of the free software-only official derivative of Ubuntu? And we were pleased and surprised at how many entrants we got. We had 79 correct answers. Um, a couple of wrong ones included GNU Sense and GNU Ubuntu, and also Ice Weasel. The correct answer was, in fact, Gubuntu, and the winner is Mark Fowl. And he was selected at random by Mark Shuttleworth. We'll send uh, a token for the Canonical store. And we'll have another competition in the next episode. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. So, have we yeah. got any emails this week? Yeah, we've got quite a few. Um, we've got one from Emmett Stewart, who says, who sent our names into space, which is really quite cool. Into space? Yeah. Um, he's gone to NASA... I assume this is a scheme they're running rather than him personally contacting them, and uh, included our names and the name of Mark Shuttleworth on a chip that will fly on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, and we've got a certificate to prove it, so the Ubuntu UK podcast has just gone into space. We have a correction from uh, episode three. We talked a little bit about uh, virtualization, uh, VMware parallels and that kind of stuff. And uh, one term that we used was uh, unified mode. We were talking about running Windows applications seamlessly in a window on your Ubuntu system. And in fact, in VirtualBox, which is the application we were talking about at the time, it's actually not called unified mode. It's called seamless mode. So all those people who were Googling for unified mode on VirtualBox and didn't find it, many apologies. It's seamless mode. Yeah, and there's a wiki page on the Ubuntu wiki to tell you how to set it up. Yeah, we'll link to that. We had a comment on the blog from Kennedy808, don't have a real name, asking if we can set the genre tag uh, on the files that, that we make available for download to podcast so that they can be sorted on his Archos uh, MP3 player and I believe other MP3 players as well. And we're going to look into that. So hopefully when you get this episode, it will have the right genre tag. Right, we spoke about uh, pseudo and security and things on the last podcast. Chris Oates emailed him about removing pseudo escalation. And he suggested creating uh, a button on one of the uh, application bars. So you press the button and it removes uh, pseudo. So the command is simply uh, sudo minus k. Uh, and that's it. So as soon as you've finished with your pseudo, punch the button and it's all gone. And um, your vulnerability is removed. And we think Fedora has got an icon for that built onto its GNOME desktop that shows when you've got your sudo rights. Oh, yeah. I think I've yeah. seen that. And you yeah. can kill it from that. But oh. we don't have that on Ubuntu. Perhaps we should. Yes. Uh, one thing I got from somebody who'd listened to that podcast was that they misunderstood what you meant when you said sudo rights. And actually what you were talking about was sudo rights in that little pop-up dialogue that asks you for your password as yeah. opposed to the command line, which wasn't always very clear. That, that, yeah, that's not clear that when you're on the command line you type sudo. You're using sudo, but when you're using the GUI, just a box appears, doesn't it? Asking you, you for your password, which, yeah, which is, is what you were talking about a lot of the right, time. Right, okay. So, thanks for clarifying. We had an email from Tony Arnold following our discussion on Unix malware in the last episode, and he says that weak passwords are still the major route by which Linux boxes are compromised, and that very often the compromise is not to get access to that machine, but to use it as a staging post to attack other boxes as part of a distributed sort of denial of service. Um, he also mentions that uh, a live CD version of a distro ran with an SSH daemon active 
activated by default with it a very easily guessed default password uh, he had a machine compromised via that route uh, it really pays to be careful about your passwords and how you manage them and what services you're running so it's a sensible message really we had an email from Thomas uh, from Vienna Austria uh, that wanted to drop us a line to say thanks for the podcast and how much he actually likes it he's saying he switched from Ubuntu one month ago and is using free software 90% of the time he's saying how great it is to be part of the community Nice one. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks for the mail, Thomas. You can contact us by the usual means. Email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Or you can leave up to 30 seconds of voicemail at 0845 508 1986. You can also follow our Twitter feed, which is twitter.com slash UUPC. Or you can interact with the Ubuntu UK community via the IRC channel, hash ubuntu-uk on the Freenode network. We also have a Facebook group. Search for Ubuntu UK Podcast on Facebook and you'll find us. And if you add the Linux application on Facebook, we are available as a podcast in that. And it's possible then to play the latest episode through your Facebook profile. It does that automatically, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a bit scary. And that about wraps up the emails. Okay, and that's the end of the show. Um, I'd like to say thanks to our guests. We had Laura, Pete and Phil. Thank you to our sponsors, Show Me Do and Bitfolk. The next episode is going to be recorded at uh, UDS in Prague without me. Yeah, sorry about that, Simon. Sorry, Si. We'll send you a postcard. Thanks. (laughs) 